Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on, you know, where you are in this world. God bless you. This is Gloria White coming to you from Utah, USA. Today we're going to continue in the New Jerusalem Holy Bible, and we are in 1 Maccabees. We are in chapter 11, beginning at verse 54. The subtitle, Jonathan opposes Demetrius II, Simon retakes Beth Zor and the Hazor incident. After this, Trypho came back with the little boy Antioch, who became king and was crowned. All the troop that Demetrius had summarily dismissed rallied to Antioch and made war with, on Demetrius, who turned tail and fled. Trypho captured the elephants and seized Antioch. Young Antiochus then wrote as follows to Jonathan, I confirm you in the high priesthood and set you over the four districts and appoint you one of the friends of the king. He sent him a service of gold plate and granted him the right to drink from gold vessels and to wear the purple and the golden brooch. He appointed his brother Simon commander-in-chief of the region from the ladder of Tyre to the frontiers of Egypt. Jonathan then set out and made a progress through Trans-Euphrates and its towns, and the entire Syrian army rallied to his support. He came to Ashkelon, and was received in state by the inhabitants. From there, he proceeded to Gaza, but the people of Gaza shut him out, so he laid siege to it, burning down its suburbs and plundering them. The people of Gaza then pleaded with Jonathan, and he made peace with them, but he took the sons of their chief men as hostages and sent them away to Jerusalem. He then travailed through the country as far as Damascus. Jonathan now learned that Demetrius's generals had arrived at Kadesh in Galilee with an, a large army, intending to remove him from office, and went to engage them, leaving his brother Simon inside the country. Simon laid siege to Beth Zor, attacking it day after day and blockading the inhabitants till they sued for peace, which he granted them, though he expelled them from the town and occupied it, stationing a garrison there. Jonathan and his army, meanwhile, having pitched temp, oh, excuse me, pitched camp by the lake of Genesir, rose early, and by morning were already in the plain of Hazard. The foreigner's army advanced to fight them on the plain, having first position an ambush for him in the mountains, while the main body excuse me, while the main body was advancing directly toward the Jews, the troops in ambush broke cover and attacked first. All the men with Jonathan fled. No one was left except Matthias, son of Absalom, and Judas, son of Calphia, the generals of his army. At this, Jonathan tore his garments, put dust on his head, and prayed. Then he returned to the fight and routed the enemy who fled. When the fugitives from his own forces saw this, they came back to him and joined in the pursuit as far as Kadesh, where the enemy encampment was. And there they, pit, there they themselves pitched camp. About 3,000 of the foreign troops fell that day. Jonathan then returned to Jerusalem. Jonathan's relations with Rome and Sparta. When Jonathan saw that circumstances were working in his favor, he sent a select mission to Rome 
to confirm and renew his treaty of friendship with the Romans. He also sent letters to the same effect to the Spartans and to other places. The envoys made their way to Rome, entered the Senate, and said, Jonathan the high priest and the Jewish nation have sent us to renew your treaty of friendship and alliance with them as before. The Senate gave them letters to the authorities of each place to procure their safe conduct to Judea. To Judea. The following is a copy of the letter Jonathan wrote to the Spartans. Jonathan the high priest, the senate of the nation, the priest, and the rest of the Jewish people, to the Spartans, their brothers, greetings. In the past, a letter was sent to Onias, the high priest, from Arios, one of your kings, stating that you are indeed our brothers, as the copy subjo subjoined attest. Onias received the envoy with honor and accepted the letter, in which a clear declaration was made of friendship and alliance. For our part, though we have no need of these, having the consolation of the holy books in our possession, we venture to send to renew our fraternal friendship with you, so that we may not become strangers to you. A long time having elapsed since you last wrote to us, we, for our part, on every occasion, at our festivals and on our appointed days, unfailingly remember you in the sacrifices we offer and in our prayers. As it is right and fitting to remember brothers, we rejoice in your renown. We ourselves, however, have had many trials and many wars, the neighboring kings making war on us. We were unwilling to trouble you or our other allies and friends during these wars, since we have the support of heaven to help us, thanks to which we have been delivered from our enemies, and they are the ones who have been brought low. We have therefore chosen Numius, son of Antioch, and Antipater, son of Jason, and sent them to the Romans to renew our former treaty of friendship and alliance. And we have ordered them also to visit you, to greet you and deliver you this letter of ours concerning the renewal of our brotherhood. We shall be grateful for an answer to it. The following is the copy of the letter sent to Onius. Arios, king of the Spartans, to Onias, the high priest, greetings. It has been discovered in records regarding the Spartans and Jews that they are brothers and of the race of Abraham. Now that, now that this has come to our knowledge, we shall be obligated, obliged, excuse me, obliged if you will send us news of your welfare. Our own message to you is this. Your flocks and your possessions are ours, and ours are yours, and we are instructing our envoys to give you a message to this effect. But you think about this, that they made an alliance with the Romans. The Jews made an alliance with the Romans, and later the Romans were crucifying the Christians. Wow. Subtitled, Jonathan and Chloe, Syria, Simon and Philistia. Jonathan learned that Demetrius's generals had returned with a larger army than before to make war on him. He therefore left Jerusalem and went to engage them in the area of Hamath, not giving them the time to invade his own territory. He sent spies into their camp, who told him on their return that the enemy were taking up positions for a night attack on the Jews, 
At sunset, Jonathan ordered his men to keep watch with their weapons at hand, in readiness to fight at any time during the night, and posted advance guards all around the camp. On learning that Jonathan and his men were ready to fight, the enemy took fright and, with quaking hearts, lit fires in their bouviac and, and decamped. Jonathan and his men, watching the glow of the fires, were unaware of their withdrawal until morning. And although Jonathan pursued him, pursued them, he failed to overtake them, for they had already crossed the river El Lutherius. So Jonathan wheeled round on the Arabs called Zacbadians, beat them and plundered them. Then breaking camp, he went to Damascus, thus crossing the whole province. Simon, meanwhile, had also set out and had penetrated as far as Ascalon and the neighboring towns. He then turned on Joppa and moved quickly to occupy it, for he had heard of their intention to hand over this strong point to the supporters of Demetrius. He stationed a garrison there to hold it. Building Work in Jerusalem Jonathan, on his return, call, called a meeting of the elders of the people and decided with them to build fortresses in Judea and to heighten the walls of Jerusalem and erect a high barrier between the citadel and the city to cut the former off from the city and isolate it to prevent the occupants from buying or selling. Rebuilding the city was a cooperative effort. Part of the wall over the eastern ravine had fallen down. He restored the quarter called Chaphinathia. Natha. Simon, meanwhile, rebuilt Adeda in the lowlands, fortifying it and erecting gates with bolts. I think we can read the finish of this chapter, which we've run into chapter 12 now. Jonathan falls into the hands of his enemies. Trypho's ambition was to become king of Asia, assume the crown, and overpower King Antioch. He was apprehensive that Jonathan might not allow him to do this and might even make war on him. So he set out and came to Beth Sheen in the hopes of finding some pretext for having him arrested and put to death. Jonathan went out to intercept him with 40,000 picked men in battle order and arrived at Beth Sheen. When Trypho saw him there with a large force he hesitated to make any move against him. He even received him with honor, commended him to all his friends, gave him presents and ordered his friends and his troops to obey him as they would himself. He said to Jonathan, Why have you given all these people so much trouble when there is no threat of war between us? Send them back home Pick yourself a few men as your bodyguard, and come with me to Ptolemus, which I am going to hand over to you, with the other fortresses and remaining troops, and all the officials, after which I shall take the road for home. This was my purpose in coming here. Jonathan trusted him and did as he said. He dismissed his forces, who went back to Judea. With him he retained 3,000 men, of whom he left 2,000 in Galilee, while a 1,000 accompanied him. But as soon as Jonathan had entered Ptolemus, the people of Ptolemus closed the gates, seized him, and put all those who had entered with him to the sword. Trypho sent troops and cavalry into Galilee, and the great plain to destroy all Jonathan's supporters. These concluding that he had been taken 
and had perished with his companions, encouraged one another, marching with closed ranks and ready to give battle. And when their pursuers saw that they would fight for their lives, they turned back. All reached Judea safe and sound, and there they lamented Jonathan and his companions, being very frightened indeed. All Israel was plunged into mourning. The surrounding nations were all now looking for ways of destroying them. They have no leader, they said, no ally. We have only to attack them now, and we shall blot out their very memory from all peoples. That was, there's so much treachery. You see it here, and this was a very long time ago. But it seems man never changes, that they're constantly in some kind of war, fighting one another for some power or just to, for the um, pleasure of existing. Interesting. Very interesting. And as always, <laughs> I love you.